On behalf of Robin Roy Whitka, I would like to extend his sincerest gratitude for being invited to present at the ASA's 40th Annual Conference. He was honored to be asked to present alongside Alberta's most renowned archaeologist. It was with great regret that he had to cancel such an opportunity. I am humbled, too, to be here today and will attempt to fill his shoes. In 1965, when Wormington and Forbes published an introduction to the archaeology of Alberta, Canada, Little to no information was known about the boreal forest of Alberta. But by 1975, only 10 years later, all that would have changed. Upon entering this region, archaeologists immediately realized that the area was not a vast wasteland characterized only by muskeg, numerous varieties of flying and biting insects, and a lack of resources making habitation nearly impossible, but rather, this area had been inhabited by multiple generations of people living in the region from the time of deglaciation to the beginning of the oil sands exploration in the early 1900s. Over the past 40 years, archaeologists working as consultants, academics, and employees of the Alberta Survey have contributed to a better understanding of what people did in the boreal forest during the pre-contact and historic periods. The boreal forest of Alberta is quite large, and as such, I'll be focusing only on my area of expertise, the Athabasca oil sands region, just north of Fort McMurray. The Athabasca oil sands region is home to over a thousand previously recorded archaeological sites, some of which have yielded the densest archaeological deposits in all of Canada. While the majority of these sites are small in size, ranging from 50 meters by 50 meters, several sites extend over a kilometer in length. The Athabasca oil sands region is geographically diverse and is bisected by the Athabasca River, which was likely used as a travel corridor throughout the pre-contact and historic periods. The Athabasca River initiates from Lesser Slave Lake and flows east and north to Fort McMurray where it captures the Clearwater and Firebag Rivers. People traveling from the east could have used either of these waterways to travel north, south, or west along the Athabasca River. To the north, the Athabasca flows by Lakes Clare and Athabasca before joining the Peace River, a major watershed for the entire northwestern part of the province. The river flows then into the Northwest Territories and would have likely have been used as an access route for those traveling south from the subarctic regions of Western Canada. To the west of the Athabasca River lies the Birch Mountains, known for its tertiary-aged chert pebbles and quartzite cobbles sources of tool stone that were exploited by pre-contact people. To the east is the Fort Hills, around which the Glacial Lake Agassiz floodwaters bifurcated, leaving this area open for early occupation. While some of you may have never trekked through the forest, forests of the Athabasca oil sand region, there's a high probability that most of you have heard at least two things about the archaeology of the area. One is that the cultural assemblages are dominated by a single raw material type, Beaver River sandstone, and two, that the majority of this raw material has been sourced to the quarry of the ancestors. Hopefully, by the end of this presentation, you will know that the archaeology in the region is a fair bit more interesting than just sites and quarries dominated by one raw material type. The first half of this presentation will focus on three known quarry locations, yeah, three known quarry locations, and how the excavations at those sites helped develop a baseline of knowledge regarding how this area was used in the past. Our first stop on our tour of the Athabasca oil sands region will be the Beaver Creek Quarry, located along the Beaver River just west of its confluence with the Athabasca. Here's a close-up view of where the site is. During one of the initial surveys in the Athabasca oil sands region, Timothy Losey noted a high concentration of Beaver River sandstone artifacts at site HGOV 29, which would soon become known as the Beaver Creek Quarry. Upon further inspection, he identified a three to five foot glacial erratic of the same raw material type. Subsequently, he excavated the site to determine the nature of the cultural deposits. The results of Losey's 40 square meters of excavation at the site yielded an assemblage indicative of raw material extraction and reduction. Artifacts related to the extraction of the raw material from this large float block of Beaver River sandstone included 18 hammerstones and 27 hammerstone fragments a single anvil, and um, and eight very sleepily angly, angled end scrapers. When compared to the Quarry of the Ancestors and Creeburn Lake assemblages, the collection of 45 hammerstones and hammerstone fragments is incredible, as neither of these other quarry sites yielded more than a few hammerstones each. 
based on the recovery of hammer stones, as well as impact scars and battering on the float block of raw material, Losey interpreted that the Beaver River sandstone was extracted through hard hammer percussion. However, he also believed that the wood, that wood antler and bone fabricators would have also been used to extract Beaver River sandstone from the float block. Based on the collection of eight steeply angled end scrapers and the presence of strong lips on the platform of a large portion of the debitage, um, oh yeah, here, okay, sorry. The majority of the end scrapers, 17 to 14, exhibited bits with edge angles from 76 to 85 degrees. Losey suggested that the an angle of the edge scraper bits was representative of working bone, antler, or wood, perhaps to create fabricators for tool stone acquisition and billets for the production of bifaces. It should be noted that a high percentage of block shatter and low percentage of decortication flakes were collected from the excavations at this site. This was consistent with the extraction of Beaver River sandstone from a large block of raw material rather than small water-worn cobbles. This difference is important and will be further explored relative to the Creeburn Lake assemblage. A total of 40 bifaces and 41 biface fragments were collected from the excavations at the Beaver Creek Quarry. This pattern of raw material acquisition and reduction into bifaces for the transport of raw material would become a signature trait of the sites associated with Beaver River sandstone across the entire Athabasca oil sands region. Even 40 years after Losey's excavations, this patterning of core reduction to biface production for the transport of raw material holds true and reflects many of the workshop assemblages recovered from sites on both the east and west sides of the Athabasca River. In addition, the artifacts related to raw material procurement and reduction, artifacts reflective of campsite activities were also recovered. One lance-lit projectile point and two corner-notched points were collected. Losey interpreted the landslip point to be agate basin in style, while the corner notch specimens were most similar to Bassant. Although these styles may be debated today based on the current cultural chronology of the region, the relative age of these points still suggests that the quarry was likely used shortly after deglaciation and at least one time during the middle pre-contact period. Other artifacts of interest include additional scrapers with edge angles more consistent with hide scraping activities, four microblades, a variety of tools and small concentrations of non-Beaver River sandstone artifacts, including quartzites and turts. Although the excavations at Beaver Creek Quarry proved that the site was used as a Beaver River sandstone quarry, the coarse grain nature of the raw material was not consistent with the finer grain specimens recovered from shovel crust tests across the Athabasca oil sands region. Thus, the source of the fine grain raw material was yet to be discovered. However, the artifact assemblage would recovered from the excavations at Beaver Creek Quarry would set a precedent for what types of artifacts would be expected at other sites in the region. Oops. We will now continue on our tour of the Athabasca oil sands region and travel approximately 15 kilometers up the Athabasca River to the Creeburn Lake site. Historical resource impact studies conducted in the late 1970s and early 1980s by Head, Conti, Ronigan, and Mallory identified numerous sites within close proximity to Creeburn Lake. In 1989, these sites would be consolidated into a single site, HHOV 16, known as the Creeburn Lake site. A total of 104 square meters of excavation was conducted within the site between 1978 and 1989. During the shovel testing and excavations at Creeburn Lake, it was quickly noted that the amounts of artifacts recovered was consistent with those collected from the Beaver Creek Quarry. And it was suggested that this area, too, may have been a primary source for Beaver River sandstone. During 1989 excavations, Head and Van Dyke examined exposures along Mills Creek and noted large cobbles of this raw material. Unlike the large glacial float block at the Beaver Creek quarry, which did not exhibit an outer cortex, the raw material from Mills Creek exhibited water-worn cobble rind, which is reflected in the artifact assemblage recovered from the excavations in the form of primary and secondary decortication flakes. Furthermore, the raw material was much finer grain than the Beaver River sandstone procured from the Beaver Creek quarry. It was clear to Head and Van Dyke that the artifacts produced at Beaver Creek Lakes or Preburn Lake site were from a local source of Beaver River sandstone cobbles, not from a large float block, as were the assemblages at the Beaver Creek Quarry. This identification has allowed future archaeologists working in the area to distinguish between artifacts produced from large float stone blocks as opposed to those produced from small cobbles. 
Another significant discovery at the Creeburn Lake site was the identification of natural stratigraphy at excavation block D adjacent to Mills Creek. This was the first excavation and remains today to be one of the only sites in the region where stratigraphic separation of cultural material has been identified. The lower occupation yielded evidence of in situ reduction of very large Beaver River sandstone cores, while only small cores of Beaver River sandstone were identified in the upper occupation. This may indicate that the largest cobbles of raw material were exploited by the earliest inhabitants of the site, leaving only small cobbles for future occupants. The artifact assemblage produced during core reduction were different from those at the Beaver Creek site. As mentioned a moment ago, the source of raw material at the Creeburn Lake site was from glacially deposited cobbles, not a large float block. As such, numerous primary and, uh, primary and secondary decortication flakes were recovered from the Creeburn Lake ex excavations. Also, in contrast to the Beaver Creek quarry, the assemblages from Creeburn Lake had lower incidences of block shatter. This is likely due to the higher quality of the raw material. Recent excavations at sites adjacent to Creeburn Lake have yielded artifacts of fine grained Beaver River sandstone with cobble cortex and trace fossils. It is possible that the presence of these trace fossils may distinguish the raw material procured at the Beaver or at the Creeburn Lake site from other sources of Beaver River sandstone in the area. A soil sample was collected from the buried paleosol at Block D and yielded a radiocarbon age of 1,240. This suggested that the lowest component, which was associated with the paleosol, represented a much younger occupation than the agate basin and basant occupations observed at the Beaver Creek quarry site. While the Creeburn Lake excavations produced raw material or evidence of raw material procurement and reduction into bifaces, evidence of other activities were also recovered. Block A yielded a cache of large size debitage, an end scraper, a biface, and three large core fragments. No medium or small size debitage or other artifacts were associated with this cache. In 2007, during excavations on the west side of the river along Jocelyn Creek, Ewell identified a similar cache, suggesting this was a practice that was likely conducted throughout the region, but as the majority of excavations which have been conducted in the area tend to focus only on areas of highest artifact return, very few of these caches have been identified. In addition, later stage and more highly finished bifaces, as well as used end scrapers with more acute edge angles indicative of hide scraping were also recovered from the Creeburn Lake site. Interestingly, one of the tools yielded protein residue for guinea pig, which is likely beaver or muskrat, and another tool yielded residue for bison. The variety of raw material types collected at the Creeburn Lake excavations was much higher than that at the Cree or Beaver Creek Quarry with one excavation block yielding 6% non-BRS artifacts. This is striking in compared to the typical 99.9999% <laughs> Beaver River sandstone assemblages that we find even today. It is likely that this higher percentage of non-Beaver River sandstone raw material is likely reflective of the site being used primarily as a gathering area where pre-contact travelers would meet to exchange ideas, commodities, and genetic material with stone procurement perceived as a secondary activity. Let's reconnoiter, and that's a word that Robin really likes, reconnoiter. So let's reconnoiter our way um, north, east um, from the Beaver Creek Quarry along the Muskeg River overland, or overland southeast from the Creeburn Lake to the Quarry of the Ancestors. As you can see from this aerial view of the Quarry of the Ancestors, visibility of the raw material is not as obvious as one might think. In fact, the only surface exposure of Beaver River sandstone in the quarry is within a small creek that runs through the site, exposing small, hand-sized, water-worn, but angular nodules of this raw material. Similar to the Creeburn Lake site, multiple archaeological sites have been consolidated to form the Quarry of the Ancestors site complex. Excavation within the Quarry of the Ancestors has been limited by the protection of the site as a provincial heritage resource. However, some excavations have been conducted by Nancy Saxberg, Robin Wawicka, and Daryl Breziak within the quarry, and hundreds of meters have been excavated at sites adjacent to the quarry by Nancy Saxberg, Lorraine Bryant, Michael Turney, Michelle Wickham, and myself. 
the archaeological assemblages recovered from the quarry of the ancestors are relatively unique, but do sh share some similarities with the Beaver Creek quarry and Creeburn Lake sites. One striking difference is the recovery of numerous anvils and bipolar cores. It appears, based on these artifacts, that pre-contact people were reducing nodules of Beaver River sandstone through bipolar percussion. While this may seem odd, as bipolar reduction is typically reserved for raw material conservation, it was a necessary strategy for Beaver River sandstone given the variability of the raw material. While some artifacts related to bipolar production have been recovered at the Beaver Creek Quarry and Creeburn Lake sites, they have been in very limited quantities. It is possible that the reliance on bipolar reduction at the quarry of the ancestors may not only be due to the characteristics of the raw material itself, but may also be related to the time period in which the quarry of the ancestors was occupied or the cultural affinity of the flint nappers reducing this raw material. Similar to the Creeburn Lake and Beaver Creek quarry sites, the majority of sites within the Athab and the majority of sites within the Athabasca oil sands region, thousands of crude bifaces were produced at the quarry of the Ansport ancestors for the transport of raw material. A wide variety of projectile points have been recovered from the excavations within and adjacent to the quarry of the ancestors, indicating the site was used from the time of deglaciation to the late pre-contact period. Here's an example of some projectile points collected from Turney's 2012 excavations along the northern edge of the quarry of the ancestors. Other artifacts of interest recovered from the quarry of the ancestors are numerous wedges and gravers, both artifact types typically associated with the working of wood, bone, and antler. Whether these tools were used to create fabricators for raw material extraction, such as those collected from the Beaver Creek Quarry, or for daily campsite activities such as making bone needles, bone awls, bone pressure flakers, felling wood for campfires, making bows and arrows, or other campsite activities is currently unknown. Not only does the quarry of the ancestors provide us with data regarding raw material procurement and reduction, as well as a window into the daily tasks of pre-contact inhabitants, but the sediments within the quarry offers a detailed stratigraphic record of the short period of deglaciation for the region. This data is critical for us to understand what the landscape looked like when the earliest people arrived, including types of plant, animal and plant resources that may have been available. Combined with the data for uh, deposits accumulated during post-deglaciation, we can see how the landscape has changed since the arrival of the earliest inhabitants. As you can see from the crossbed and laminated sediments, this landscape would have been quite dynamic as the ice was melting. Heading north on our tour from the Quarry of the Ancestors and approximately 500 meters north of the Creeburn Lake site, we'll make a short visit to Ronigan's Ridge. Ronigan's Ridge was identified in 1980 by, you guessed it, Mr. Brian Ronigan himself. Um, this site stood out as being different uh, from many other sites in the region, given the presence of small but dense artifact concentrations. The number of artifacts recovered indicated that the site was either inhabited by a large group of people for a short period of time or multiple um, times by small groups of people. The site was excavated in 1997 and 1998 by Nancy Saxberg, 1991 and 2001 by Brian Ronigan and Grant Clark, and 2009 and 2010 by myself. The results of these excavations indicated that this site had been occupied on multiple occasions and the artifacts that were recovered were deemed to be unique relative to other sites in the region. As such, Ronigan's Ridge has been protected from impact even to this day. Although a small portion of the site, so... Uh, I don't even see, oh, there we go, right here. A small portion of the site was impacted during the 2000s. The majority of the site remains intact. Here's an example of some of the amazing artifacts that have been recovered during the excavations at this site. Projectile points reflect occupation from the early to late pre-contact periods, stone drills, end scrapers, wedges, adzes, spokeshaves, hafted flakes, unifaces, large biface, and microblade core, microblades, and hundreds of flake tools have also been collected. In 2009, the excavations focused on a strategy proposed by Ives based on his work in the Birch Mountains region of the Athabasca oil sands area in the late 1970s and early 1980s. Ives indicated that by opening up large contiguous excavation blocks, horizontally discrete activity areas could be identified and compared. This was important as most sites in the region lack stratification. 
By comparing horizontally discrete activity areas, some temporal control could be ascertained. The results of this excavation strategy at Ronigan's Ridge are as follows. This figure illustrates the largest block excavated at Ronigan's Ridge and consists of 133.5 square meters. Typical of other sites in the region, several biface reduction workshop activity areas were identified, but in the areas of lower artifact density, even more interesting finds were uncovered. A small concentration of Peace Point Chert was recovered from the north central portion of the excavation block. This area contained exclusively Peace Point Chert, indicating it represented either a separate occupation or a specific activity area. The closest known source for Peace Point Chert is located over 100 kilometers from the site, suggesting the raw material was either brought in with the occupants of the site or traded into the area in exchange for Beaver River sandstone. Adjacent to the Peace Point Chert, in an area of incredibly low artifact density, was a small scatter of only medium and large sized cores and block shatter. This patterning was inconsistent with other workshop activities identified at the site and may be similar to the cache of large size artifacts that was identified at the Creeburn Lake site. Of greatest interest was a bone concentration surrounded by quartzite scatter. No Beaver River sandstone was identified within two meters of these artifacts. Similar to the Peace Point Chert concentration, it is possible that this portion of the site, too, may represent a separate occupation. The bone was dated 2,030 years before present. Note that today over 20 bone features have been excavated in the Athabasca oil sands region, and 100% of these features have been associated with quartzite artifacts. While the reason for this association remains unknown, several quartzite end scrapers have been recovered from within or directly adjacent to many of these bone features. A small cluster of end scrapers, six in total, were recovered from the central portion of the excavation block. It's in yellow, so you may not be able to see it. I don't know where this pointer is. Anyway, it's right in the center. Um, as some of these end scrapers were fashioned from quartzite, it's possible that they represent the same occupations as the bone and quartzite feature and likely reflect hide scraping activities. The results of excavation excavating large contiguous blocks to identify laterally discrete activity areas was highly informative and proved that areas of lowest artifact density yields artifacts of higher interpretive value. This strategy has been used on numerous times at multiple sites across the region with similarly exciting results. Heading approximately seven kilometers from Modern Goods Ridge and located along the north edge of the Quarry of the Ancestors, we will now travel to site HHOV 506. I identified this site in 2010 through an intensive shovel testing program which yielded 38 positive shovel tests representing multiple activity areas. I was fortunate to excavate this site the following summer. A total of 230 square meters were excavated at this site, but we only have time to concentrate it on Block B today. A similar pattern of quartzite associated with the bone feature was also identified at this site, but the assemblage appears to be much more recent than the bone feature encountered at Ronigan's Ridge. The excavation block was initially placed over an area of comminuted calcined beaver bone identified in Shovel Test 7. This was expanded, encountering a most unique assemblage, including several different activity areas believed to be associated with a central hearth feature. The beaver bone was concentrated in an area of approximately 1 meter by 2 meters in size, extending only to a depth of 15 centimeters. While no ash or charcoal were observed, the bone was associated with a yellowish tan stain. The horizontal extent of the bone and yellowish tan stain are typical bone features excavated in the region. The feature was radiocarbon dated to 130 plus or minus 40 years before present. As the excavated excavation progressed, a concentration of moose bone was identified to the west of the beaver bone. The faunal remains were dated to 90 plus or minus 30, an age which overlaps the beaver bone date. A small concentration of quartzite debitage was encountered within and directly north of the moose bone and included two expedient scraping tools. The association between the moose bone and quartzite suggested perhaps that this artifact assemblage represented a protohistoric period occupation. This is significant as it represents an incredibly thin slice in time in northern Alberta's history. The notion that this assemblage may represent a protohistoric period occupation was further supported by the recovery of a dense concentration of fire-broken rock at the north end of the site. While fire-broken rock concentrations are the norm on the plains, this is the only fire-broken rock feature that has been identified in the Athabasca oil sands region. 
Given the presence of highly processed moose and beaver bone in conjunction with the fire broken rock, it is likely that the rendering of fat and grease from animal bones was conducted at this site. It is possible that this technique was learned through recent encounters with people from the south, or even representative of a First Nations wife brought up from the south by a European fur trapper. The clinching and final piece of evidence that this assemblage may represent a protohistoric site was the recovery of two pieces of scrap metal. As the metal would have been a highly prized commodity during this time, it is not surprising that only scraps were found. A dog harness consistent in style with harnesses used at the turn of the 20th century was recovered from an excavation block approximately 16 meters to the south. A spent munitions cartridge was collected from the excavations only six meters to the south and dates between 1866 and 1932. Finally, a possible clay oven was also encountered only a few meters to the east of the rifle casing. While it is impossible to determine if these additional artifacts and oven feature are related to the protohistoric occupation, it is certainly possible. The good preservation of the possible oven feature suggests that it is recent in age. As clay ovens are not typical in the boreal forest, this could be further evidence of contacts with plains groups. We now continue our trek heading back west to the west side of the river, approximately eight kilometers north of Beaver Creek Quarry, where we began to the historic site HHOW 55. The site is located on the south side of an unnamed tributary to Jocelyn Creek. The site was excavated in 2008 by Yvonne Chorlin. At the time of the recording, the cabin was in a total state of disrepair. Only hand-cut logs in the shape of a foundation, a historic artifact scatter, and blazed trees remained as evidence of the site. Based on other cabins recorded in the area, it is possible that this cabin may have looked something like this. Dendrochronology of a blaze in tree from the center of the excavation block dates to 1930s to 1940s. This Oneida Victor muskrat trap was manufactured between 1881 and 1930, which is generally consistent with the age of the tree's blaze. Similarly, this blue ribbon manufacturing company, Spiceton, was produced from 1887 to 1959. In addition, these artifacts, a Winchester Rifle Arms Company spent cartridge was also recovered and dates between 1866 to 1932, as well as a Dominion cartridge that dates between 1886 and 1947. Lastly, this bone flesher was also recovered from the site. The preservation of the bone flesher indicates that although acidic soils, although soils are acidic in the boil forest, recovering bone tools from recent historic sites remains possible and every effort to recover such artifacts should be attempted. Many First Nations lived in this area, surviving off the land between the 1950s and 1960s, still practicing some of these traditional activities. Finally, we will head back to the east side of the river to the Fort Hills and to the home of the Bitchmont site. Bitchmont was founded in 1927 by Robert C. Fitzsimmons, oh, there we go, um, of Prince Edward Island. Fitzsimmons was the first to employ oil extraction through heating bitumen and hot water tanks. By 1931, this approach was proved to be profitable, and in its heyday, Bitchmont produced over 2,000 barrels of oil per day. Fitzsimmons sold his product as roofing and road surfacing material, inspiring the now dreaded tar sands name. During the Great Depression, Fitzsimmons struggled and by 1942 could no longer run the Bitchmont facility. He sold the company to Lloyd Champion of Montreal, who ran the plant with difficulties until 1949 when he sold Bitchmont to the government of Alberta. Although still considered commercially viable, the discovery in oil of oil in Leduc only two years prior discouraged investors and by 1958, Bitchmont was abandoned. Archival research on the Bitchamont plant conducted by Robert Warwicka indicated that locals from Fort Mackay would cross the river to work at the Bitchamont facilities. Thus, the trapper who occupied the cabin I discussed only moments ago theoretically could have been one of those employees. This is merely one example of how interweaved the archaeology, traditional land use, and histories of the Athabasca oil sands region is. In summary, the Athabasca oil sands region has been occupied by people for over 10,000 years. Based on excavations conducted by consulting, academic, and survey of Alberta archaeologists over the past 40 years, over 40 bone features dating from 7,220 to the 1950s have been identified. Projectile points reminiscent of Paleo-Indian spear points have been collected from multiple sites across the region, and it won't be too long before we excavate, excavate datable bone features associated with these point styles. It's just a matter of digging in areas of low artifact density where campsite activities actually occurred. Raw material types collected from sites on both the east and west sides of the river indicate that people have been traveling from the Athabasca, 
to the Athabasca oil sands region from as far away as the Mackenzie Mountains in the Northwest Territory, over 1,000 kilometers to the north, 500 kilometers to the west from Mount Itziza in British Columbia, and 500 kilometers to the south from the Northern Plains. While these people may have been brought into the area by the ease of travel along the Athabasca River, they came back for the area's abundant resources. 